Well, let's continue. Um, every session I teach, for the last several years, every session of this course, but every session I've taught of anything, at some point or another, I talk about using muscle testing as a tool for functional neurological evaluation. And this is no, this is no exception. Um, we're going to talk about it each session, some of the same material, sometimes said in the same way, but a lot of little things said in different ways to try to give an idea of how to use muscle testing and put it in the context of what we're trying to look at when we look at the human body using muscle testing as a tool for evaluation. And we're really looking at it as a tool for neurological and sometimes neurochemical evaluation. And so in that context, we consider muscle testing a part of functional neurology. Muscle testing equals functional neurology. And it's a tool for functional neurology, and as opposed to pathological neurology. Now, the, the, um, the reference paper on which this whole concept is, is based is a paper written by Sam Yannick and myself, which is called the uh, Neurolog Expanding the Neurological Examination Using Functional Neurological Assessment Part 2, Neurologic Basis of Applied Kinesiology. It was published in the International Journal of Neuroscience in 1999. There was a part one that Sam wrote with Tom Motika, which was more of a, a review of literature. But we actually took the co concepts of using muscle testing as an extension of the neurological exam and applied kinesiology challenges as, a, as an extension of neurological examination procedures and wrote a paper on that. It's a pretty extensive paper. And that is available online at my website and um, www.theuplink.com. And it's also available at uh, ICAK's website www.icakusa.com, and there's a link to that. Um, applied kinesiology is a system which evaluates our structural, chemical, and mental aspects. It employs muscle testing with other standard methods of diagnosis. Nutrition, manipulation, diet, acupressure, exercise, and education are used therapeutically to help restore balance and maintain well-being throughout life. Now, that's the definition of applied kinesiology. Let's just pick that part a little bit. Nutrition. Nutrition affects body chemistry, and body chemistry affects neurotransmitter production, and neurotransmitter production affects the ability of nerves to carry messages. In addition, nutrition is tasted. Taste bud receptors are activated when we eat nutrition. We get a neurological effect of the taste buds, even when we have the patient tasting it, even lying on the table, or when they eat a food and they taste it, we're supposed to chew. We activate neurological pathways from nutrition. Manipulation. Manipulation stimulates muscles and joints and sends feedback into the nervous system to try to restore normal function. Obviously, it has impact neurologically. Diet and nutrition, we talked about diet. We're supposed to taste our substances, and we can get clues from muscle testing what things we need to eat differently. As far as macronutrients, diet, and micronutrients, uh, vitamins, minerals, and that type of thing. Acupressure, acupressure, because it's acupressure, is obviously affecting different acupuncture points, and we tap different acupuncture points. Not this one, but some of the different acupuncture points. And the different acupuncture points, that's causing a neurological stimulus. It's a mechanoreceptor stimulus. Um, exercise is setting up mechanoreceptor activity. And education is actually the basis for giving the patient a proper lifestyle. Um, but with the exception of education, which is also affecting the patient's left brain to a degree, um, all these things are... Um, neurologically based therapies. They're all going to impact neurological function to a certain degree. So with that definition of applied kinesiology, we can look at the neurological basis for applied kinesiology, and it's the same as for chiropractic. Not everybody in here is a chiropractor, but the neurological basis for AK and the neurological basis for chiropractic are really, um, can be used interchangeably. So this is the definition of chiropractic by Dorland's Medical Dictionary, 28th edition. And the 30th edition, which is out now, it changed it, and it's not as good. They watered it down some, but chiropractic is a science of applied neurophysiologic diagnosis based on the theory that health and disease are life processes related to the function of the nervous system. Irritation of the nervous system by mechanical, chemical, or psychic factors is the cause of disease. Restoration and maintenance of health depend on normal function of the nervous system. Diagnosis is the identification of these noxious irritants, and treatment is their removal by their most conservative method. I like that definition. And what we want to do then is take that definition and diagnose the process that's wrong with the patient. It said life process, let me go back. It said health and disease are life processes related to the function of the nervous system. And interference with uh, nervous system function by mechanical, chemical, or psychic factors. This is a structural, chemical, mental triangle that applied kinesiology uses as a triad of health. Um, are factors are cause of disease and we can identify noxious irritants. And noxious irritants are 
a, the body is aware of noxious irritants by what type of nerve endings? Nociceptors, okay? And so we identify the noxious irritants and treatment is removed by the most conservative method. Now we can also find noxious chemicals which are picked up by chemoreceptors, taste buds, and olfactory receptors and so on, which could be noxious as well that aren't picked up by, by the uh, nociceptors as such. But typically noxious irritants in the body are, are nociceptors. So we want to diagnose the process. What is the life process that's uh, gone awry, not just the name. And if we look at certain processes, we have simple processes in the body and they have many different ramifications. But simple processes include like facilitation and inhibition. Facilitation and inhibition. And facilitation and inhibition gives us the basis for understanding um, in the relative to what we're talking about this weekend, where there are low back pain and pelvic problems, we can look at the imbalance between, in the patients who have symptoms, imbalance between low back nociceptors and low back mechanoreceptors, which result, uh, by balancing those things, result in pain relief. So we're going to talk about fixing the low back, and we're going to talk about it relative to thinking in terms of processes of looking for patterns of facilitation and inhibition. Facilitation arising from or inhibition arising from different joint disruptions. Facilitation and inhibition arising from different injuries to muscles. So facilitation and inhibition arising from different factors that affect individual muscles, which is going to be the next session we're going to talk about. We're going to go back over all the muscles and talk about different clinical factors that are related to uh, things we can do to help individual muscles that are not functioning properly to get them to facilitate if they're inhibited. And then in the autonomic nervous system, we have facilitation and inhibition as uh, in the sympathetic nervous system. And the sympathetic nervous system is either sympathetic or parasympathetic. I mean, in autonomics, it comes down to simply sympathetic or parasympathetic. And you could have facilitation of sympathetic or inhibition of sympathetic and facilitation of parasympathetic or inhibition of parasympathetic. All these are possible. And as we get into further sessions, we'll be talking about that. Even next time, we'll be talking a little bit about facilitation and inhibition of some of the autonomic uh, effects, uh, how nervous system, or autonomic nervous system functions relative to uh, gut dysfunction. But we still have simple processes, processes of facilitation and inhibition, processes of sympathetic and parasympathetic. In the case of oxidation and reduction, every chemical reaction you can think of can be broken down into oxidation and reduction. There are redox reactions. There's always an oxidative step when there's a reduction step. The reduction step could be called the antioxidant step. You have an oxidant and an antioxidant, but the chemical step is reduction. And so these things are supposed to be in balance. However, sometimes there's a problem where there's too much oxidation because there's not enough antioxidant capacity. So you get over oxidized. Or you could have not enough oxidation. You could have impaired oxidation because the processes that make oxidative phosphorylation to make ATP to make oxidative activity function are not functioning. You can have Im impairments of oxidative phosphorylation, for example. And different tissues have to be oxidized or reduced to change their chemical format as far as either activating them or inactivating them. As far as synthesizing molecules, you have different processes of oxidation at one step and maybe reduction at another step to, to add pieces onto molecules. And then as we said, certain things turn on in an oxidized state, certain things turn off in an oxidized state and turn on in a reduced state. So this, but still, it's basic chemistry. It's simple processes, you see. And so what we're going to talk about relative to that this weekend is we're going to talk about vitamin E. We've already mentioned it. We're going to talk about vitamin E relative to low back muscles. And what we'll find out is that there are a whole bunch of low back muscles and muscles that attach to the pelvis that are vitamin E related muscles. Dr. Gerhardt found out early on that every muscle had, virtually every muscle, had one or more nutrients that was related to. And he found that most of the pelvic nutrients were related to vitamin E, or most of the pelvic muscles were related to the nutrient vitamin E. And so there are, are systemic patterns of nutrition, which we'll talk about later, but there's this nutrient pattern of low back muscles related to vitamin E. And what it suggests is a person who has a vitamin E deficiency will have low back muscle imbalance and will lead them very likely to a low back problem. So let's think about that for just a minute. Oxidation reduction, patients over-oxidize because they don't have enough antioxidants. And the antioxidants, <coughs> excuse me, the antioxidants they don't have enough of is vitamin E. Often there's a number of antioxidants they don't have enough of, but let's say they don't have enough vitamin E. Then they're going to have weak muscles, then they're going to injure their back, and because vitamin E is an antioxidant, they're going to get increased inflammatory response. So it's going to aggravate the mechanical problem by a chemical problem. And by knowing what Dr. Hart learned in the 1960s about vitamin E related to the low back muscles, we can right away know that one of the things we we'll have to look at for sure is vitamin E when we got a low back problem and test it on the patient and see if it's appropriate. So it fits with this idea of what we're talking about this weekend. So many low back patients have the low back problem because they have a vitamin E imbalance in their body. 
Oh, now what did I just say? I said a vitamin E imbalance. Before I said low vitamin E, all of a sudden I said vitamin E imbalance. And if you're listening closely, you said, I said before I was talking about low vitamin E, and all of a sudden then I said vitamin E imbalance, which is not the same thing, is it? What if a patient hasn't had low vitamin E? What if they have the opposite? What would be the opposite of low vitamin E? Too much vitamin E. What if they have too much vitamin E? Well, if they have too much vitamin E, guess what muscles will be most likely to be inhibited because of excessive toxicity of vitamin E? The vitamin E muscles that are low back muscles. I mean, we're going to get to this later, but relative to this concept right now, an imbalance, too much or not enough, of vitamin E can create a problem in the low back. And we have a lot of patients out there who are self-medicating with vitamin E and taking too much. And we'll talk about that a little more later, too. It's very common, actually. So in the acupuncture system, we have yang and yin. And we talked last time about the acupuncture head points being the yang points. And again, simple processes, yang and yin. In the endocrine system, we have only two problems. We can have too much of a hormone or not enough of a hormone. That's basically all there is to it. Now, it can get pretty complicated because you've got a bunch of different hormones, but you've got too much or not enough. And so if you have too much hormone, there's two reasons for it. One reason there's too much hormone is the body makes too much. What would be another reason for too much hormone? Right, not breaking it down fast enough. So you could have too much for that reason. You could have not enough. You could have not enough because the body wasn't making enough, which is the most common reason. Or, theoretically, you could have not enough because the body was breaking it down too fast, and that could happen on occasion as well, although it's rare. In the immune system, the same thing. You have too much or not enough immune system response. So in the immune system, you could have too much or not enough response, which could be interpreted as a person who had not enough immune response or lower immune response, would be a patient who had, like, catching every infection that came along. Too much immune response would be a patient who had the immune system attacking when it shouldn't, a hypervigilant immune system, if you will. And in that case, that patient might have an immune system which is creating too much immune activity, creating inflammatory processes and or allergic processes because it's, oh, it's taking a carrot, which the body should re not reject, but saying that's, that's carrot, that's not me. And it overreacts, it's hypervigilant, and you get an allergic reaction to the carrot because it overreacts to the carrot. So you can have an immune system which is under overfunctioning. Again, simple processes. And we can isolate and break down each of those processes in a standard uh, protocol, which we've been, that's what the protocol is all about. So we have this facilitation, inhibition, sympathetic, parasympathetic, oxidation, reduction, yang, yin, endocrine, immune, and so on. There's simple processes, and they can fit together in complicated ways. But what we need is a roadmap to kind of guide us through the different processes. And try to through the, the, the most optimal way to get from one point to another. So we kind of got, got a map quest, and you go on map quest, and you can, or one of the other mapping um, uh, websites, and you can, a, it can ask you, do you want the quickest route? Do you want the most scenic route? Do you, you know, what route do you want? Well, we want to probably get the most efficient and quickest route, but that's what the AK clinical protocol is, the most quick and efficient route to get to the result of the patient's health. And what we th look at then is we consider what D.D. Palmer said way back in 1910. He said, in 1910, he said, too much or not enough nerve energy is disease. Now, pretty much every profession would tell you the body heals itself. Pretty much everybody would agree with that. How they approach that then is different. D.D. Palmer said, too much or not enough nerve energy is disease. And I would tell, tell you that too much or not enough anything is disease. Too much or not enough chemistry like we talked about is disease. Too much or not enough yang and too much or not enough yin is disease. Too much or not enough endocrine function. This too much or not enough that Didi talked about is, is really a, a concept which is very useful in applying, the, looking at the different processes that we deal with and looking at how we have to identify the processes that are going wrong. And I can throw a whole bunch of those processes at you and you can like, try to stumble through them like we've been doing for 30 years, in my case 30 years of practice, but we've organized them in a way that's the most efficient way to approach them. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to remove obstacles and give the body what it needs. If there's an obstacle, there may be too much of something because blocking like a dam and the water backs up behind it. Or not enough, there may be a deficiency. So too much, we want to remove the obstacles. And not enough, we want to give the body what it needs, structurally, chemically, or mentally, that triad of health. It could be structural, chemical, or mental that we have to address where there's too much or not enough to allow the body to heal itself. And then Sherrington in 1912 or so, or 1914, talked about facilitation and inhibition. This was several years after D.D. Palmer wrote the book the chiropractor's adjuster in 1910 and said too much or not enough nerve energy is disease. Sherrington came along and used the words facilitation and inhibition. They weren't in use before that, or D.D. Palmer probably would have used those terms. But um, in modern neurology, we say facilitation and inhibition. And relative to muscle testing as a tool for functional neurological evaluation, this 
represents itself as terms of strength and weak responses to muscle testing. So we can help the body heal itself by using muscle testing to find out where the patterns of facilitation and inhibition are, as Didi Palmer would say, where there's too much or not enough nerve energy, to give the body what it needs or remove the obstacle structure chemically or mentally so the body can heal itself. And that's sort of philosophical basis for the things we do.